I thought we would do something kind of unique tonight because uh, <clears throat> I want to introduce a couple of really fine emerging poets to you who have collaborated with me for a long time, especially in the media of publications and collages and words and poetry. And so I want to introduce to you the first poet tonight, <clears throat> actually originally from San Diego, and he came to San Francisco on the 14 mission bus from San Diego, I don't know. It's <clears throat> One of those sort of magical realist moments. Uh, and has been here collaborating for a long time at San Francisco State with Sipakli, that great uh, journal of uh, literature, and with the ongoing series, uh, Voz Sin Tinta at Alicat Books. So with that, uh, please give a warm welcome to my colleague and friend, uh, Jose Cadena. Pensamientos. My thoughts sometimes take me to the train where grandmother told me to watch the ships on the dock. The warships my uncles, her admired sons, had built. From San Isidro to Encanto, the murals would greet me with an imagined diversity. If lost behind the big bags of women who carried them from downtown to Tijuana, grandmother would call me to go with her and rest my head on her arm. There would be instant friendship with little boys and girls, but times were shy. How strange the way adults want their children to say hello to other children in harmony as to train them for romance. Two, yesterday I lost a dream in this room. It was sitting on the sofa or on the floor under the rug running around I don't remember if there was a lollipop or a bow tie, but there might have been cotton candy. These combinations may mean that I desire essential sticky pleasure with good humor, or good humor will take me to a desired sticky pleasure, or sticky desired pleasure will result in humor. There was a duck and there was a lake, and it means that I may be fertile right now. I saw grandmother looking out the window at the place that was once her home, yellow walls, yellow floor, apron, yellow all. There was no black ocean in this one. There was no entering envelopes, falls, or persecutions. There was no somewhere, my love. There was hail. This dream was about hail and the fertile challenges that I am facing. Actually, I think I want to read a poem in honor of um, one of the great figures of the Mission District. Some of you might know him, hanging out. You see him every time you go down 24th Street. You can't miss him. Yes, I'm talking about uh, Alfonso Texidor. Yes, no, maybe. Yes, yeah, no, I guess. I, I, I guess the rest of you are from Walnut Creek. <coughs> uh, and so Alfonso is actually one of the great figures, I think, myth mythical, legendary almost, is now in the hospital at uh, Laguna Honda. So uh, many, like a few years ago, we had a benefit for him. And uh, I wrote this poem. So maybe I'll start with this poem for uh, Alfonso. It's called Machetero. The machete is not just for cutting cane, Alfonsito. It is also good for decapitating snakes, cutting trails, raising huts, and to defend against hunger, loneliness, misery, and anguish. It is the best friend of the poor. It rebutes the arrogance of the powerful and lowers by about 10 inches the height of the rich. You know, I've kind of um, been working in, in the noir genre. And if you know noir, it, of course, it refers to those things that happen in the darkness. And they happen in the darkness because they are of moral ambiguity. Things like, you know, no, nobody mentions that there's $250 billion missing from the wars in Iraq and other places according to our own government accounting agency, yeah? So where do you hide 250 billion? That's, that's B like in bastards. <coughs> the same place you hide torture, yeah? 
in the darkness. So um, recently, actually, they just finished uh, a few weeks ago an uh, independent film based on my short story, The Other Barrio, about um, arson and displacement and gentrification, corruption, murder, sex, you know, the mission district. And let me read you the opening paragraphs of that short story. It's called The Other Barrio. I think you can find it somewhere online or something. <clears throat> it was on the corner of 16th and Valencia, the Apache Hotel, a once elegant residence for out-of-town visitors. More recently, a run-down joint for several dozen single men and some desperate families. Every time I go by the spot, I still hear the screams, the cries for help of those who were caught in the fire the night the Apache Hotel burned down. The newspapers screened the headlines the next day, seven dead in fire. It didn't state the cause, but I knew I would be dragged into it, and I didn't want to be dragged into it. I had sighted the place three times, but not for fire hazards, just the common stuff, garbage and rodent infestations. Had there been a fire hazard, God himself could not have stopped me from making sure the owner took care of it. Now, it was going to come down to me. That's why Choi had taken me off the case. He was, he was my sh shithead boss at the Department of Building Inspections and my job was on the line if my report had failed to mention a fire hazard, which it did not. Seven people had died, and I wasn't going to carry those dead. They weren't my dead. Let whoever killed them carry them. I want to introduce a really fine emerging writer that I have a lot of respect and admiration for. and. Uh, We've published her in, in the journal Zipagli and have uh, featured her in the reading series uh, Voz Sin Tinta. So she's going to read us a short story. So please give us a warm welcome to right from the Mission District on the 14 Mission bus, Estela Duran. Um, so this uh, short story is called The Men Outside Home Depot. I watched the eight men stand outside of Home Depot waiting for work. It's hard because you can't hire all of them. You technically aren't supposed to hire any of them. There are criminal charges for aiding undocumented aliens. Yet here I am in my two-door Mazda, scoping out the parking lot, making sure that the police didn't put these men here to set me up. My yard is probably the size of an average living room, the front yard no bigger. I could do all the yard work. It would take it all day, but I've done it before. Still, I am here and have every intention of hiring about three of these guys for two hours of work and paying them $50 each. I want to do this because they are people just like me. They are the people who aren't holding signs asking for money. Instead, they are here at Home Depot waiting for work. I see brown skin like my own. I see dark hair and eyes like my own, filled with hope that someone will pull up and say, hop in. I give money to the homeless. Why can't I give them work to someone who's why can't I give work to someone who is asking for it? My politically correct friends tell me not to hire those undocumented people. They tell me they will only stay if you keep giving them work. I tell them these people are my people. My friends assure me in any other circumstance I would not use this phrase. They are right. My family's from Texas and they've been here since after the Alamo. My grandparents left Texas and came to California back in the 80s. I don't have any family in Mexico or South America or in any speaking, speaking, Spanish-speaking country, but they speak the language my grandparents spoke. My grandparents were both fluent in English and Spanish. My mother tells me that when my grandmother, my grandmother lived in Texas, she had servants who only spoke Spanish, and that's how she knew. I'm here at Home Depot, not trying to hire servants, but to hire people who need work. Am I no different? Identity is skewed. I tell three of them to get in my car in my Americanized Spanish accent. 
They pull the seat forward and all squeeze in the back. I say one of them can sit in the front. They politely nod and call me senora and say that the back seat will do just fine. I tell them to put their seat belts on. They don't ask what I need them to do or how much I will pay them. The only sound in the car is from the CD in, in my car playing Johnny Cash. I let them out of my car and show them the weeds and the grass that need to be cut. The three men compliment the appearance of my home with their hats against their chests. I show them where the tools are and they get to work immediately. I watch them for a few seconds from inside the house. It's a hot day, so I take them bottled water. I feel this need to be overtly nice to them. They are timid and grateful. It's so hard to imagine a life of instability where you have no idea where you will, whether you will make money for yourself or your family on a daily basis. They move quickly. I ask them what their names are as they work. The man pulling the weeds tells me his name is Fermin and that he's from Guatemala where his wife and two kids are. The youngest one pruning the roses says his name is Manuel and he was born in Mexico City. The shortest one who hardly spoke says his name is Tino and leaves out where he's from. The youngest one asks me my name and where I'm from. I tell him my name and I say I was born here. He looks back down at the rose bush. Then he asks where my parents are from. Tell him my mom's family is from Texas and my dad was born in El Salvador. The shortest one looks up and asks me which part in a Spanish accent very similar to my father's. Reaching over to hand him gardening gloves, I tell him, I don't know since my father never told me. Tino says he is from El Salvador too and attempts to talk to me more about my dad, eager to hear details. I feel a strange guilt when I'm unable to give him any information, real or made up. I knew nothing of El Salvador other than my father being born there. I wish I had known at least the name of a town or a place that I could mention just to connect with Tino. Instead, all I could do was shrug my shoulders and smile. Dino looks at the American flag hanging from the pillar and tells me in Spanish without any eye contact that I should find out more about my dad's childhood and, and the life in Salvador. The two other men look at Dino in a way that says he should probably work more and talk less. <laughs> my mother's car pulls up and she waves from inside. As she gets out, she looks at the men. I'm so glad you hired people to do this. You can't keep doing this on your own, you know. She turns to them and says, why, hello there. The men nod politely and send her a broken, hello. My mother asks if we're still getting sushi and I tell her that we will as soon as they're done. I invite her inside and she smiles. The men continue working and I tell them if they need anything that I will be inside. My mom asks where I found them. I tell her Home Depot and she scoffs. You can't just pick up people off the street and take them to your home. All three of them could have locked you in a room and robbed you blind if I hadn't come. I told her she worried too much and that they seemed like nice people. She rolled her eyes and dug in her purse, handing me a business card. She says, here, call Robert next time. He's a landscaper and always does the job right. Plus, you shouldn't be hiring those people. They overcharge their, for work these days. I hear a knock at the door and all three men tell me they're finished with the yard. I give them $50 and they tell me that it's too much. They were only here for 20 minutes. I tell them it's okay and offer them a ride back to Home Depot. Fermin puts his hands in a prayer pose and says that they can walk, that it's not that far. I smile and can't remember how to say, I appreciate what you've done in Spanish. So I too put my hands in prayer pose and respond with what I know. Gracias. I watch them walk down the street past all the different sized American flags on the porches of my neighbor's houses, all different sizes yet representing the same thing. I see my neighbor Dan watering his plants and following the three men with his whole body. They take off their hats and bow to him. He clenches his lips together and doesn't nod or show any regard to their politeness. He looks back at me and waves, howdy neighbor, how are you? I lift my arm with my hand wide open. I'm well, thanks. And then quietly, I'm doing well. Thank you. So uh, thanks for joining us again tonight here for the 
serigrafia, uh, reading here in conjunction with um, the exhibit. If you haven't seen the exhibit, it's totally tremendous. And I also want to take uh, time to thank Joan Jasper. Joan, thank you for inviting us to come by. Let's have a hand for Joan back there. Uh, and um, we, we might have another poem or two. And, um, and then uh, we'll have a question and answer period. And if that doesn't work out, we can put on the gloves and fight out there, past the exit sign. You know, I hate it when these poetry readings are so calmado. It's like, <laughs> come on, you know, let's lively it up a little bit. So anyway, uh, I want to bring back Jose. I had to tell you that uh, we're also kind of honoring Jose tonight because um, First of all, he just graduated from San Francisco State University with a master's degree in uh, fine arts and uh, <coughs> in, a, in a debt that could sink a couple of countries. It is slow dancing time, and a little girl is affixed to how this song makes the adults move, and how those men in white with carnations on their chests sing and play the music some with their eyes closed. And there again is the little girl who's opening a window to look out and she forgot she has a braid. Dad is a little late from work and mama slicing up the bread, listening to the static radio, guilty of loving you. Here it goes. <laughs> mm. Nothing you do can make me mad was a lie I once told. Here we go. So maybe people will identify with this one. My knee made a little sound, a cranking of some sort, while I was going up these stairs. What the fuck was that? Was that age? A reminder that these legs won't last forever? And then, so then, I'm going to read, I wrote this, these are very fresh, and let's see what happens with how you receive these. I saw this horrible video on the news about this plane being blown up. So here we go. I see these horrible images I cannot process. A head like a watermelon spread, smoke and metal. Here, they have all become contortionists. Okay, and then I'll just finish it with something really fun. That's pretty dark. Here we go. An auntie asked grandmother if it was okay for me to play dolls with my sister. But I remember playing with grandmother's wig. And why did grandmother have a wig? Did I believe her hair was her own? And why does your birthday cake have a rainbow, dad asked. And dad gets mad when he sees those kinds of things. After the sort of more noirish noir poems of Jose's, I think there was a noir poem in there too, no Jose. By the way, noir has become really big. I have a stack of books this high in my study of noir Latino writers' uh, novels. Yeah, it's just a total explosion of that genre because we're living in the golden age of noir, right? The golden age of scoundrels, swindlers, shysters, and hucksters. So kind of the world is upside down in a way. So let me offer you a poem. <coughs> El Mundo. Al revés. It's a strange world we're living here, where fat buzzards perch on trees while good food lies on the ground, and all around, children in their bare feet. It's a strange world we're living here. There's some hard knocks on this block, where everywhere you look, there's heavily armed cops and a body or two that never had a chance to scream, stop, because there's some hard knocks on this block. Es el mundo al revés, donde van corriendo los pez, y los pajaritos nadan, y los gatos pardos ladran, pues así es el mundo al revés. It's a weird scene on this street 
where you're taught to lie and cheat, but in the end, it doesn't matter who you are, you're just another piece of meat, because it's a weird scene on this street. Oh, it's a strange world they're selling here, where no one looks you in the eye and the budget goes for hate and war and fear. So the best thing is not to buy anything, because it's a strange world they're selling here. Es el mundo al revés, donde van corriendo los pez, y los pajaritos nadan, y los gatos pardos ladran, pues así es el mundo al revés. I'll end with this one so that we have a little bit of time to converse and talk. And uh, <clears throat> I know uh, John said there's some of my books for sale back there. And you know, m most writers, if you buy their book, they'll sign it for you. You buy my book, I sign it for you twice. <laughs> so I'm actually moving into very much into the, the sort of other genres, I think. I'm trying to explore. So this is a new poem, fairly new. It's called uh, Diablo Moon. He stands at bar, fingers split with cigarette, smoke unfurling from his mouth, an angry mixtec god scratching the mahogany plank, the brawls in prison still ahead. He was 19, scorched as the hills behind him. She was 28, ancient Yorona mama baby in blue jeans and leather jacket come to set him free or on fire. After they escaped flee fleeing her square husband in Pinol, the beers and oldies looped around his heart, tying his memories to her hand on the wheel drunk on plum wine, making out as she drove, one hand around his neck at 75 miles an hour. And that's when she crashed, the crimson Mustang, twisting it around an oak tree on Highway 4 at the foot of Mount Diablo. The explosion singed their eyelashes and the five years of rage that followed. Okay, so I think uh, that's enough car crashes and <laughs> bar fights. I didn't read the poem about the bar fight, huh? It's all right. Uh, and all other exigencies that might have happened tonight. But I always like to have a dialogue for a few moments with the audience in case some of you have something that's been keeping you up late at night that has to do with writing. I, I did see a preview of the movie um, at the Brava, and so I was wondering, oh, nice. and it was quite a while ago, so could you update people, you know, up, you mentioned your, and you read your first uh, part of the book, so I would like to hear an update. Well, well they have finished it, ah. and so um, I know the producers are very excited about that. Uh, they have submitted it to the Toronto Film Festival, the, um, I believe the San Diego Film Festival, and the Mill Valley Film Festival. And uh, they feel pretty strongly that uh, they have a, a really good chance at Mill Valley. So, so we'll see. Yes? But no, it is finished, done in the can, as they say. So we're very uh, excited about that. You say this connected with uh, Sarah Graffia? Uh, yeah. yeah, exhibit next door, and I saw I um, the um, two poster artists over there. I went on Wednesday and saw that, and taught, um, I wanted to know if you were involved in any kind of social political movements like that de depicted in the posters, like United Farm Workers or anything like that. Have you ever been involved in that? Well, if you look closely at especially some of the posters around Nicaragua, the red and black ones, 
that have uh, Sandino's figure on it. You'll see my name appearing as a participant, as a poet, in a lot of those events. And in fact, uh, along with Roberto Vargas, the great Nicaraguan poet of the Mission District, actually named honorary uh, poet laureate of the Mission, uh, organized a lot of those events, especially the ones around Nicaragua. That was part of our specialty during that period. I've got a question, Alejandro. Okay, John. How, how did you get into the noir genre? How did that all come about? Well, you know, and, and I think uh, in part growing up, perhaps some of you saw a lot of those dark black and white movies late on television. I, I never understood them. I just knew they were in black and white and there were heavy things going on, but I couldn't tell what was going on. Uh, but I think it's one of the, the great genres that allows the, the writer to enter it and tell a story of a very sort of complex nature. But the easy part, I think, is that the structure is already there, yeah? So you just, you just in a way, kind of fill in the characters and the situation and stuff. But you have to realize, because a lot of people don't, that crime fiction Detective stories, thrillers, are not the same as noir. Yeah, and I th for me, that's a huge dis distinction that I'm constantly trying to tell people, right? Noir, which is why I say it's the golden age of noir, deals with corruption. Yeah? Those things, that, as I said, that happen in the shadows because they are of moral ambiguity. Yeah? In fact, uh, I don't think I brought it, but I have a piece called The Late Hour of the Night, in which it talks all about the things that happen in the late hours of the night. Yeah? The, the sense of noir, that's what it means, darkness, shadows. Yeah? So for me, and, and as I mentioned, it's not just myself, right? Uh, it's become really a sort of phenomena internationally. I'm reading Italian noir novelists, uh, there's Greek, noir novelist, um, as I mentioned, tons of Latin American noir, <laughs> it's like, which obviously means we're li living in the great golden age of corruption, <laughs> right? What else can it mean? <laughs> Hi, yeah, I was wondering what, in what way or what groups uh, you know about are the ones that you think uh, would be most helpful to be involved with in dealing with this immigration issue and these children being put in like little tiny rooms, like 10 by 10, like 100 of them freezing to death? Uh, what, well, what, what do you think we should do? As well, you know, I've written opinion pieces precisely on that issue, yes, and here's my perception, and I think historically I'm proven accurate, right? Why are people fleeing, for example, Honduras? Yes? Uh, we forget that just three years ago, our very own President Obama, Democrat, liberal-leaning, African-American, overthrew the democratic government of Honduras, right? Returning it to a decrepit oligarchy that has looted that country for 100 years, and now Everybody's fleeing Honduras. Well, you, you just, my metaphor is, you are burning down the houses of Latin America. What do you expect them to do? And notice what Obama's doing. The most absurd thing, to get someone and put him back in the fire? He just burned the house down of Honduras. So as long as the United States continues to intervene in Latin American affairs in this way, right? That flood is of human beings fleeing those fires are gonna continue. So, there you go. Stop intervening in Latin America, right? Stop um, overthrowing the governments, etc. And things uh, obviously might improve, but very complex issue. But a very important question. <clears throat> and keep in mind that for thousands of years, migration on this continent has gone back and forth, right? There's, in fact, probably more North Americans in Guadalajara than there is Mexicans by now, or in San Miguel de Allende, right? So it goes back and forth. Okay, well, let's hear it for our poets tonight. Okay, <laughs> come up here, Jose. <coughs> Estela, come up here, take a bow.
Really, hey, really, really proud of uh, these emerging riders right out of the Mission District, right out of our community. And uh, Estela Duran, take a bow. Take a bow. Yay. Story. Yay. And Jose Cadena, take a bow. Yes. Thank you very much. And all of you, take a bow.